Good evening, everybody, and welcome tonight to this, our time of study. We're so grateful that you have joined us on this Tuesday night, the Experience Bible Study. I'm Reverend John Kenny, the pastor of Third Baptist Church, and we're so honored and so grateful that you are with us on this Tuesday evening to the glory of our God. We're thankful for the privilege that we've been given to share as people of faith. We're thankful that God has allowed us to be able to come around this medium and to share in this time of study on tonight. For we recognize that it's only by the grace of Almighty God that we have this privilege, that we have this opportunity, that we have this moment in time. A moment we'll never get again, a moment that we should all treasure and, and hopefully make the most out of it. Because the truth of the matter is, is that life is like a vapor. And we're grateful for God allowing us to be able to share on tonight and to be able to be in his presence on tonight and to be able to study around the word of the Lord. Whether you're on Facebook Live tonight, whether you're on our website tonight, whether you're on Zoom tonight, whether you're on the phone line tonight, where if you may be on Instagram tonight, wherever you are joining us from tonight, we're grateful and thankful for your presence in this, what we call the experience Bible study. Why do we call it the experience Bible study? Because we firmly believe that every time we gather in the presence of our God and in the presence of the Holy Spirit, it is going to be an experience that we will all enjoy. So we're grateful for God to allow us this space and this time tonight. And with so much going on around us and so many things happening in our presence and in our midst, um, we would be remiss tonight if we didn't think about and consider and pray for those families of those uh, three football players who were killed and the other two who were wounded and injured from the gunshots um, that took place on this past Sunday. We also pray for the suspect and his family, amen, because sometimes we always get caught up in the victims and we pray for the victims and their families, but we don't always consider that there are other victims in addition to the ones who were directly affected, family members of those suspects who, who have committed these kind of acts, they're also victims. And so tonight we wanna start this study tonight with prayer, but we wanna pray especially for those persons who are dealing with this burden of loss and tragedy of life and, and loss of life and so many things that come along with it. So let's pray. God, we thank you tonight. We thank you because it's only by your grace that it wasn't us. It's only by your grace that our families were not affected. It's only by your grace, oh Lord, that we can stand on this side tonight of tragedy. And God, we're not going to be selfish and thank you for what you've done for us, but we're gonna to pray tonight for those family members who lost their sons, lost their brothers, lost their cousins and their nephews and their grandchildren, lost their friends, we want to pray for the entire student body at the University of Virginia for the trauma that they now have to walk through. We want to pray, oh God, tonight for the suspect because none of us really know exactly what went on with him and all the details surrounding it. But we pray for him, oh Lord. We pray for his family who now must deal with the fallout and the stigma and all that comes along with that. And God, then we pray for our political leaders. We pray, oh God, because at some point, at some time, money should take a back seat to the lives of people. Political interests should take a back seat to the lives of people. And so we pray, oh God, that even in the midst of tragedy, because your word says in all things you work 
for the good of them who love you and who are called according to your purpose. That even right now, God, you would work according to your sovereign and providential will and plan and help us to see what that plan and will is. Bring comfort, bring healing, bring peace. It may take a while for some to experience those things, but walk with them now, O oh God, through that experience. And as we turn our attention tonight, O oh Lord, to your word and to our time of study, open our hearts, open our minds as we begin now this road to recovery that we too might find healing, comfort, and peace as your people. Bless us tonight, and we promise to give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. And my brothers and sisters, we're so grateful tonight for all of you all being with us on tonight. We pray tonight that you will be blessed because of our time together. And we are going to look at tonight, we're going to be taking a look tonight at Matthew's gospel. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter number 20 tonight, um, verses 20 through 28. And we're going to be looking tonight at this idea of uh, the road to recovery as it relates to serving, because that's one of the priorities that exists in the life of every believer, that God has saved us, not so that we could sit on an island by ourselves, but God has saved us and called us to a place of service. And so tonight in Matthew chapter number 20, there's an interesting story because what Jesus does is Jesus lays out for us this um, reality of what service is and what service is ultimately not. Jesus lays out for us this idea tonight about what service um, boils down to as it relates to all of us as believers, all of us as people of faith, that we, we have to embrace and understand the, the conundrum, if you will, that is attached to this idea of service. Now, I want to give you tonight the, the key verse out of Matthew chapter number 20. And the key verse for us tonight is going to be verse number 28. And if you have your Bible, if you can turn there, get your Bible, get your notebook, get your pen, make yourself some notes tonight, hopefully and prayerfully, it'll bless you in the process. Amen. So um, in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 20, listen to what it says, the key verse. Jesus says, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, when we read chapter 20, beginning at verse 20, down through 28, it's an interesting story because it talks about a mother who raises a question to Jesus um, about Jesus's placement of her two sons in these places of honor that the mother is approaching Jesus and her concern or desire for her sons as it relates to their presence, participation, and purpose in the kingdom is that of prestige, honor, and notoriety. That's her perspective. That's her desire. That's her willingness for her sons to occupy a place of privilege, a place of prestige, and a place of honor. Now, what we have to understand and what we have to grab hold of before we go any further tonight is that she was making reference or she was making mention or she was asking Jesus to do this for her sons who happened to be two of Jesus's disciples. What I want to suggest to you tonight, my brothers and my sisters, is that the invitation to follow Jesus, the invitation that Jesus gives us to follow him, comes with the expectation for us to serve Jesus. 
that we're not called to follow Jesus. We're not called to be his disciples and not have the calling come with an expectation of service. That God invites us as believers. God invites us as disciples. God invites us as participants in God's plan to be an extension of the kingdom of God in the world that we live around. When Jesus called these brothers, when Jesus invited them to come alongside him, the expectation would be that they would also be servants in God's kingdom. That service is the expectation for every believer. Now, I know I may be preaching to the choir, but there may be somebody who's listening to me tonight in one of those virtual spaces and, and you have become settled and comfortable with just being a Christian, settled and comfortable with just being a person who names the name of Jesus. But what I want you to understand is that God has called you for so much more than just having the name Christian attached to who you are. That what you and I have been called to do is we've been called to be disciples and as a part of our discipleship calling, we've been called to serve. And when we think about the life of the church today, and we think about the church, the placement of the church in the world around us today, the placement of the believer in the world around us today, there can be no greater road to recovery for all of us than to recover this idea of what it means to be a servant in the mold of Jesus Christ, a servant who models the, the, the discipleship calling that's on our lives as people of faith. So again, the invitation to follow Jesus comes with the expectation that we are going to serve Jesus. Now, let's look at the storyline tonight because it's going to highlight for us several things. It's going to highlight for us this kingdom contradiction. It's going to highlight for us this kingdom conviction, and then it's going to highlight for us kingdom submission. So if you're writing down, write those down. Kingdom contradiction, kingdom conviction, and kingdom submission. So let's begin at verse 20 in Matthew chapter number 20, where it says, then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. Jesus asked, what is your request? He asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right hand and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, and, this, and the, the innuendo here is not just to the mother, but to these two sons of hers. You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Not only was he speaking to the two and the mother, but he also has the other disciples that are listening in on what this request is. So there's a room or a gathering, a collection of people that now have to hear what Jesus is saying. You don't really know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink from? Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Now we're not quite sure who the they are. We don't not, we're not quite sure if the they were the two sons, if the they were the two sons and the other disciples, or even if the they were the sons, the disciples, and the mother. We're not quite sure who the they are in the group, but they answered. Collectively, some people answered and said, oh, yes, we are able to drink. So Jesus tells them. We don't know, again, who the them are. It could be a collection of all of them. It could be just the brothers. It could be the brothers and the mother. We have no idea. Jesus tells them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit 
on my right or on my left. My father has prepared those places for those he has chosen. Now, the first thing we want to understand here tonight is that when you look at verses 20 and 21, there's this idea of kingdom contradiction. Because the mother was raising the question. She asked the question about their placement in the kingdom based upon this motivation of honor and recognition. That the request had behind it this um, desire to be recognized, this desire for honor, this desire for notoriety. And, and, and what Jesus is ultimately letting her know and letting them know and letting us know when he says, I'm not the one to determine where, they, where their placement is in the kingdom. Because what he's letting them know that and letting us know that as my disciples, not every level of service has a worldly honor attached to it that there has to be an understanding that there's this level of contradiction that exists when it comes to kingdom service and how God interprets service and worldly service and how the world interprets service. That there are a lot of people, a lot of believers, a lot of people, even in the church, who are drawn to positions, who are drawn to serving not because they are motivated with a kingdom motivation, but they are motivated with a worldly degree of motivation. The mother wanted her sons to have honor. She wanted her sons to have recognition. She wanted her sons to have notoriety. And again, not every person serving in the kingdom of God is serving from a place of recognition because Jesus lets them know and lets us know tonight that if your motivation to serve is one that is rooted in being recognized and being seen, then that is not the right perspective or the right motivation to have when it comes to your service. That all of us wants to, all of us desire to be in this place with God where we are able to fulfill what we believe is our purpose in God. But at the end of the day, we have to come to the table and recognize that service in the kingdom is not the same as service in the world. The world has an idea of what serving looks like, but God has another intention of what service ultimately looks like. He lets them know tonight in no uncertain terms that when you approach this idea of serving in the kingdom, you have to realize that there is this, this level of contradiction that comes from this idea that what you are called to do, you are called to this, pla this place of selfless and sacrificial living. There it is right there. That they want roles of service. She wants roles of service for them. And he says to them, listen to what he says when he tells them that you don't know what you're asking for because not everybody is fully equipped to serve in the kingdom of God. That may be harsh. That may be a shock to the nervous system, amen. But, but, but we have people today who are asking and soliciting roles asking to serve in places that they are not equipped to serve in. They want to serve because of how it makes them look. They want to serve because of how it makes them feel. Now, let me give you some historical context here because one of the, one of the, one of the realities and the truths about the black church is that historically, the black church has always been the place where we as African Americans could find a place of honor, find a place of recognition. Because historically, we could not find any other place 
in the culture, in the, in the social setting that would allow us to occupy places of honor and status, if you will. And so when we, because we could not get those or have those opportunities afforded to us in the world, it was the church that allowed us to find those places. But the problem comes in and the problem came in is that many people found themselves occupying places and of status and prominence and significance in the church, but they were not spiritually equipped to handle those places. Some people gravitated to those places because the world did not allow them to occupy those seats of authority. And because they could not find those seats of authority or seats of prominence or seats of status or seats of recognition in the world, they found them in the church. But because spiritually they were not equipped to, as Jesus just alludes to, drink from the cup that he is drinking from, because they were not able spiritually to handle the responsibility, they did not fulfill the kingdom obligation that God had or the kingdom expectation that God had with their service in the church. See, we have to be careful because there is this attractiveness that comes along with serving in the kingdom. There is this attractiveness, this seduction that comes along with serving in places of notoriety and places of prestige and places of honor. And if we're not careful, the seduction of the position will blind us to the severity of the responsibility that comes along with it. Look again at verse 22, when Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I am about to drink from? Now, what is Jesus alluding to here? What is Jesus making reference to? Well, Jesus is letting them know that if you're going to drink from this cup, that there has to be a willingness on the person's part to be killed, here it is, to be killed by a death that has been appointed by God. Jesus is now looking beyond the failure of the individual disciples. And he's letting them know that to drink from this cup, you, are, you have to sacrificially be willing to die the death that God has appointed for you to die. There it is right there. So, and we don't talk about this kind of stuff in the church any longer because we we somehow we we believe that this this self denial this self sacrifice this this element of suffering that we're called to partake in is something that we want to disconnect or disassociate from the reality of what serving really looks like and if we're going to get back on the road to recovery as it relates to the priority of serving, we have to understand that if we're gonna drink from the cup and we must drink from the same cup that Jesus, the bitter cup that Jesus himself drank from, we have to understand that there's going to be this or must be this willingness from our on our end to allow ourselves to endure or embrace or participate in the quote unquote appointed death that God has ascribed to our lives. And it may not be, and it not necessarily is this physical dying, but it is a spiritual dying. It is a fleshly dying. It is a dying to the personal desires that we have and that we bring to the table when it comes to our relationship with God. So Jesus is lifting for them this kingdom contradiction. The mother wants for her sons to occupy this place of prominence. The mother wants for her sons to occupy this place of status. 
But Jesus is telling her, your sons must be willing to drink from the very cup that I myself am going to drink from. And he wants to know, can they drink from that cup? Can they drink from the very cup of suffering that I myself am drinking from? So when we talk about serving, when we talk about the priority of serving, there has to be a firm understanding that number one, that there's going to be a kingdom contradiction to the level of our service, that we are not going to be able to serve God in the manner that we desire to serve God. And that we have to understand that honor and recognition is seductive in the kingdom of God, that we have to drink from the very same cup the cup of sacrifice, the cup of self-denial, the cup of, 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 of spiritual death in order for us to fully embrace and fully live out the calling and the expectation that rests on all of our lives. So he tells them, he says, yeah, you're going to drink from the same cup I'm drinking from, but I am not able to tell you which place you're going to occupy. I cannot tell you if you're going to have a place of honor or not. Only the father can do that. And the father has chosen those to occupy those seats. Now, again, it goes to the idea of being uh, uh, equipped to handle the very space that God has put people in. And sometimes we want what other people have, not fully understanding that it could very well be, I'm not equipped to handle what somebody else has been called to serve. I know it might be tight tonight, but I hope and pray it helps you in this journey that you find yourself on. So Jesus tells them, he says, look, that's not my place to give to you. I, I can't tell you which role you will occupy. I cannot tell you which seat you're going to occupy. I cannot tell you where you're going to land in all this. Only the Father can tell you that. Look at verse 24. So now they hear this, and the text says, when the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. They, they, they became upset. They became mad. They became frustrated and irritated that they would ask Jesus this. But Jesus called them together and he said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus lays out for them, he lays out for them this, this kingdom contradiction. And then he brings to them this certain level of conviction. The conviction again is found in verse number 23 when he says, yes, you're going to have to drink from the very same cup. So understand that's going to be that's going to be the reality of your experience. You're not going to be able to get away with this. You The, the conviction comes in in my life and yours is that I have to drink from the very same cup that Jesus drank from. And then after he moves from this idea of conviction, he lets them know that if you're going to serve me, and you're going to be a part of this kingdom that I've called you to. If you're going to participate in what I've called you to participate in, if you're going to fulfill the obligation or the expectation that's on your life to be a servant, you have to understand, lastly, that there is this kingdom submission that you have to conform to. Okay, what do I mean? See, not only does he contradict the world's point of view and the world's perspective, but Jesus is now letting them know that I operate from a different perspective of what servant leadership looks like. The perspective that I have and the perspective that I'm operating from is not the same perspective that those in the world 
operate from. Serving God demands us to have a greater understanding of what serving God is really all about. See, kingdom service demands a level of humility that the world frowns upon. Serving God come brings with it a level or a degree or understanding of this thing called humility. And the world does not always promote humility. The world promotes status. The world wants you to believe that you are somebody if you remind somebody that you are somebody. The world wants you to understand or to operate from a perspective that you're only significant if you're stepping on people and you're lording it over people and you are letting people know that you are above them. But Jesus says, if you're going to serve, with the mindset that I have. You do that from a perspective of knowing that humility should be your guiding force. That he is oriented to a different perspective of what service looks like. And he's trying to let his disciples know that my perspective needs to be your perspective. Now that may be hard to fathom and hard to grasp, because you are inundated with a perspective that is totally antithetical to how the kingdom of God operates. You, you are shaped and molded and influenced by perspective that is not the kingdom of God's perspective. And so you now have to reorient yourself. There it is right there. Reorient yourself to how God operates and how God defines service, how God defines leadership, how God defines servant leadership. That Jesus now is modeling for them and for us what service ultimately looks like. He, he reveals to his disciples, here it is right here. He reveals to his disciples on a, to a, on a greater level what a real relationship with God looks like. See, a relationship with God is not based upon us naming God's name. <laughs> a relationship with God is not based upon how many times we can call God's name. But a relationship with God is really going to be determined, based, revealed, and even manifested by the level of our submission to Almighty God, by the level of our humility to Almighty God, by, by, by how far we are willing to go down in our sacrifice, in our selflessness, in our willingness to be shaped and influenced by the very spirit of Almighty God. Jesus says again, listen to what he says. He says, if you want to be a leader, you first have to be a servant. If you want to be great or first, you must become a slave. See, the world flaunts their authority. The world wants you to know that they're over you and you're under them. The world wants to remind you that, that you answer to them. He says, but among you, it's going to be different. That's not how you're going to operate. That's not how you're going to think. That's not how you're going to approach this thing. Because if you want to really get a true glimpse, he says, of what it looks like, look at me. He says, I didn't come here to be served. Now, if anybody had the right to lord service or lord authority over somebody, it was Jesus. If anybody had the right to say, I am over you, you are under me, it was Jesus. But he says, I, I didn't come for that. I, I didn't come 
for recognition, for status, for notoriety, for fame. I, I didn't come to see my name in light or to hear my name called. I came to serve others and to give my life as a ransom. What does that mean, preacher? Because you lost me a while ago. You, 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 I checked out on you a while ago, so help me, bring me back now. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that our journey with God is a progressive journey that leads us to a place called glory. Our journey with God is a progressive journey towards the glory of God. And the glory of God is oftentimes arrived at through our journey of suffering. <laughs> it, it is often arrived at through our self-giving. That you and I, my brothers and sisters, are on a journey, as Paul said, from glory to glory. It does not yet appear what you shall be. That he who has begun a good work in you shall complete that work. So Jesus is saying to them, he's saying that I've come to give my life as a ransom. I've come to lay it down. I've come to sacrificially give of myself because as I give of myself, I'm moving to glory. Help us, Holy Spirit. As I die to myself, I'm moving towards glory. As I endure this cup, this bitter cup, I am moving towards glory. As I endure the hardship and the heartache and the heartbreak, as I, as I deal with the sacrificial dying of myself, I'm moving to glory. See, glory in the kingdom is not arrived from the place you occupy. Glory in the kingdom is derived from how much you're willing to give of yourself. See, the world ascribed glory to the seat you sit in. But Jesus is saying, I ascribe glory to how much you are willing to drink of this cup. I ascribe glory to how much you are willing to suffer alongside me. I ascribe glory not to the seat you occupy, not to the role you have, not to the status you are playing, but I ascribe glory to self-giving and to suffer. And my brothers and my sisters, wherever you might be tonight on this journey with God, wherever you might be tonight in your relationship with the Lord, I want to encourage you tonight. It's time to get back on the road to recover. We want to recover our kingdom service. We look around right now when there's so many people and it's heartbreaking sometimes. There's so many people calling themselves Christians and naming God's name and saying they're servants of God, but they're not willing to drink of that cup. And I want to suggest to you tonight that you can't have the name of Jesus on your life and remove the cup that Jesus had to drink from, from your life. You, you can't have the name Jesus ascribed to your life and then not have the cup that Jesus drank from being a part of your life. So as we recover kingdom service, let us understand tonight. Number one, there's kingdom contradiction. God's way contradicts the world's way. There's kingdom conviction that I have to understand that a part of my journey, a part of my relationship with God means I have to drink from the very cup. I have to experience and be a part of the same process that Jesus was processed through. And then there's kingdom submission that I have to understand that I am to be different. I have to operate from a different perspective. I have to be moved and governed 
by a different influence. And that is our challenge, not just as individuals, but as the collective body of Christ. And it is my prayer tonight that wherever you may have stopped on the road, wherever you may have fallen off on the road, wherever you may have hit a bump in the road, I want to encourage you tonight to get back on the road to recover. Recover your kingdom service to the glory of our God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless you and we honor you. We praise you and we give you all the glory. We thank you, God, tonight for giving us this space and for giving us your truth. And we ask you now, oh God, to help us to get back on the road, wherever we may have stumbled, wherever we may have fallen, wherever we may have just stopped, help us to get back on the road. Bless my neighbor tonight, oh God, with the peace of knowing that you who have begun a good work in them, you will surely complete it until the day of Jesus. Let us reclaim our priorities as people of faith. And let us embrace the bitter cup that you have placed in our hands. Because the call to discipleship comes with the expectation of service. Bless us now. In Jesus' his mighty name we pray. And all the people of God say amen and amen.